Hi everyone, I'm José Valim, creator of Elixir, and I'm here to talk about the Elixir programming language. So the title of this talk is Idioms for Building Distributed and Fault-Tolerant Applications. And that's exactly, not surprisingly, it's exactly what we're going to explore today. We're going to learn a new set of words and how we can use these words to write software differently uh, when targeting Erlang or Elixir. But before we get to this point, I want to talk a little bit about why a new programming language, what was my journey uh, for creating one. And uh, to do that, we're going to go back to 2008. And uh, back in 2008, so um, it was a little bit before I joined the Rails core team. So, uh, so we have, for those who are not familiar, uh, Ruby Rails is a, is a web framework for the Ruby programming language. And back in 2008, we, there was a new Rails release where they said that Rails 2.2 is thread safe, right? And what does it mean to be thread safe? So uh, what was happening at the time is that we were starting to have machines with more cores, with two cores, four cores, right? And uh, people were saying, hey, I want to run uh, Rails in production and on a machine that has multiple cores and I want it to work. So the idea behind thread safety is that if you have multiple cores, the way that you use all of those cores is by using threads. And the fact that it is thread safe, it, it means that you can do that and everything is going to work, right? Nothing is going to blow up. But today, in retrospect, right, I find the word thread safety very, very funny because it's about the lowest possible guarantee that you can give in software, right? That, hey, it's not going to, to blow up. You're not going to get a segmentation fault or the memory is not going to be corrupted, right? It's a very low guarantee, right? It doesn't say that the APIs are going to be ergonomic. It doesn't mean that it's going to be performant, that the developer is going to be productive. It's just like, hey, it's not going to blow up, right? Case in point, uh, when thread safety was added to, in Rails 2.2, what they did is that they put a, a mutex around your application, which means that, sure, nothing's going to blow up, but you would never serve that application, would never use both cores at the same time when serving a request, right? Which uh, I expect is not what people wanted. But sure, with time, um, the thread safety situation uh, improved, but at the same time, we would often get reports that uh, were very hard to, to, to reproduce and to fix. So, for example, we would get a report that said, hey, you know, uh, when we are having, <clears throat> sorry about that, we are having a spike in production, uh, auto scale kicks in, that brings a new instance. And while that instance is, you know, it, it has to hit the ground running. And in that process, we get some errors and sometimes it doesn't boot properly, right? And uh, those errors, they were related uh, to threads, right? And to high traffic. So there was some paths that would just be exercised when uh, there was uh, high traffic coming exactly after the machine boots. So those errors, you know, they are very hard to reproduce, very hard to replicate, and therefore they are hard to fix. So, uh, and that was, you know, at this point I was already working on the Rails core team and I was like, well, if concurrency is going to become more and more important, which I believe is the case today, right? Today we have uh, uh, watches, right, with four cores. Uh, so I was thinking, well, if concurrency is going to become more and more important, uh, we need to have better tools, better abstractions to solve those problems, right? And that was my starting point. I was like, hey, you know, I want to see what people are doing to tackle those problems because if this is, is the future, I need to have better tools. And I like to say that in this journey to figure out how to tackle concurrency, uh, <clears throat> there were two points of no return, two points where I said, wait, you know, uh, this changes everything and it changed the way I thought and approach about software. And the first of those things is functional programming, right? And functional programming means different things to, to, to a lot of people. But to me at the time, it meant two things, right? So the first one is that state is explicit instead of implicit. Because if you think about, you know, object-oriented languages like Ruby, is that one of the purposes of objects is to encapsulate state, 
right? So, you know, sometimes you have this object with this state and then an object around it and then an object around it. Uh, Joe Armstrong, the creator of, of Erlang, he has a fantastic quote on this or he says, well, well in, in an object-oriented language, you thought you, you got a banana, right? But you got the banana, the gorilla holding the banana and the whole jungle with it, right? And I think that's exactly the point is that, you know, the state is always encapsulated and there's always something around it, right? The fact that um, the behavior, right, which is often where we have the logic, is collocated with the state means that if you have complex code, right, you need to create new objects which put extra barriers around the state, just end up adding to this complexity, right? So what if we don't do that, right? What if we decouple behavior from from the state and what if the state is explicit? If somebody asks me, where is the state in the system? I can say the state is here, right? So that's the first thing that functional programming brought to my attention. I was like, wait, you know, I've been chasing state all this time to solve those issues. If the state is explicit and clear, that's going to make my life much easier. But not only that, right? If we have state, what if we stop mutating it and start transforming it? So in Elixir, if you have a list with three elements and you say, hey, I want to delete one element from the list, uh, you get a new list. We don't change the, 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 the old list in place, right? And the reason why this matters uh, there are two reasons, right? So the first one is that for concurrency, a lot of, so why we have issues with concurrency a lot of the times, we have data races, which means that you have two threads, right? Running two separate cores, and they're trying to change the same place in memory. If they try to do that, what is going to happen? Is that safe, right? Or if even if that's safe, you have a race condition, how are you going to reason about that? So if we say, well, what if we start transforming things more and start, instead of mutating them? That solves a bunch of the problem. And then, but not only that, it's not only about concurrency, is that your code is going to be much more clear if you don't have mutation. Because, you know, have you ever like called a method in an object, passing an argument, and then you're not sure. Uh, and then when you try to uh, access the argument that you passed, that object modified it, like remove the key where you did not expect it to remove it, right? So it makes much harder for you to understand the software because you're passing an argument and now it can be implicitly changed and, and there is nothing telling you that that thing can be implicitly changed, right? And then you have to track this thing now in your head. It becomes your responsibility as a developer. So, you know, when I saw those principles, I was like, hey, you know, not only this is going to solve all the issues with concurrency, not all the issues actually, it's going to solve a bunch of the issues that I have been facing with concurrency uh, all this time, I think my software is going to be much clearer, much clearer uh, for me to reason about it, right? Or for my coworker to reason about it two years later down the road. So that was the first point of no return. And then I started exploring and learning more about a bunch of different functional programming languages. And that's when I met my second point of no return, which is when I found out about Erlang and the Erlang virtual machine. So for those who are not familiar with it, Erlang is a runtime, a virtual machine that was created by Ericsson, a telecommunication company. And um, what is really interesting about Erlang is that it was designed to solve a particular set of use cases, okay? So Ericsson, as a telecommunication company, one of the things they were doing is that they were building telephone switches, right? And you can think that one of the things that a telephone switch needs to do is that it needs to be able to connect person A to talk to person B. But it's not, a telephone switch should be able to handle as many people talking at the same time as possible, right? So you start to have this idea that, well, this needs to be a highly concurrent runtime, right? You need to be able to have a lot of things going on at the same time, right? But not only that, you don't have a telephone switch, right? Sometimes you want to call somebody that it's actually in, you know, in another city or another neighborhood, right? And there is another telephone switch and that person may be busy talking to another person from another neighborhood. So you need to be able to exchange all this information, right? Those machines they need to be able to communicate with each other and to distribute this information. So, uh, so they have to think about this as well. And a bunch of other requirements, for example, how do you upgrade the code that is running in production, right? Because you, you can't, right? You can say you're going to maintenance mode. You're not going to say, hey, don't use your phone from 2 to 3 a.m., right? That's not an option. And there's always somebody on the phone, right? You cannot say, hey, you know, what if we just 
turn off everybody, disconnect everybody, and then they call again. No, there's always a connection going. So how can you upgrade the system live without bringing the system down? So how can you do hot code upgrades? So they had all those requirements, and then they built a runtime specific to, to solve those issues. And um, Erlang was used for telecommunication for a long period of time until people started to realize that these use cases that Erlang was solving, you know, three decades ago, it's the exact same use cases that we are starting to see on the web today, right? Where, um, you know, our servers or applications they need to handle many connections, millions of connections at the same time and exchange information and talk to all different kinds of systems with all different kinds of clients. And that's when Erlang, so back in 2005, 2006, that's when Erlang saw a resurgence because a lot of people realized, hey, you know, if Erlang was good for telecommunication, it's going to be great for the web, right? So we, see, we saw companies like Amazon, Facebook, um, telecommunication companies, Heroku, Riak, all using Erlang back then. And one of the most popular cases for Erlang, and this is back in 2012, so this was just when I was just starting with Elixir, was WhatsApp. So WhatsApp, um, they they I built they are built on top of Erlang, and you know throughout time they gave presentations. They were very clear about it. They said how they were using the technology, and back then they wrote a blog post where they were able to get two million connections on a single node. And I look at that and I say like, this is perfect, right? This is exactly what I want. I want to be able to write code that runs on my machine, but if I put it in production and that's a machine with twenty four cores with forty eight cores. I want to see it using all the cores as efficiently as possible, right? And that's something that today I also take to my development experience, right? I expect all the tools that I use to be using all the cores on my machine. If you're compiling some code and that compiler is not using all the cores in your machine, it's, you know, it's disrespecting your time, right? I'm serious. Like the same for like testing. If you're running the tests and you're using only one core in your machine, right? Your test could potentially be four times, eight times faster, right? You're of using all the resources that are available right now. So why it's not doing it? So I like to say that everything that we do in a machine today should be using your course. And Erlang was doing that uh, for production uh, way back then, right? And I think it's worth saying that it's not only about concurrency because the thing that it's more than concurrency because the thing that made me fall in love uh, with Erlang was that, so back in 2010, when I was, 2009, when I was doing this exploration, concurrency was a hot topic, it still is, but it was a hot topic. And we were starting to see a bunch of new technologies that were designed uh, with concurrency in mind. But the thing is, if you're, if you're writing software and that's using the machine that it, you, it has available as efficiently as possible, it's using all the resources the machine provides, but that machine is not enough. What is the next step, right? The next step is to get another machine, right? Is to, is, is to make it run on multiple machines now. So we, start, we need to think about distribution, right? It's not only about scaling vertically on the same machine, but horizontally as well. And that's what Erlang solves, right? Erlang comes with distribution. So we're saying when the switches, they're communicating with each other. So for me, while everybody was trying to answer the question to concurrency, Erlang was like, well, we answered that. And by the way, we also answered the question to, to, to distribution. And that, that's what made Erlang be the second point of no return. I said, hey, I want to write software that runs on this platform. Right, that's what I want for me. Uh, I think it's a beautiful platform. It made a bunch of excellent design choices that really resonate with me, and that's what I want to use. So I started using Erlang more and more, and I say, you know, I loved everything I saw, but I really missed some of the things that I think it's really important for software development, and that's what led to Elixir. So from this brief discussion, right? we can start to get an idea what Elixir is about, right? We can see it's a functional programming language, right? It's a concurrent programming language, and it's also a distributed, more than concurrent, right? It's a distributed programming language. So what does that mean, okay? So now we're going to get to the second part of the talk where we're going to talk about the idioms. And what we're going to do here is that we're going to learn a new set of words and how we are starting to think and design software differently with this new set of words, okay? So, Here's the code that we write, okay? Uh, so if you're using Java, Ruby, C, um, Perl, uh, 
um, this is the code this is the code of write, write sequential code, um, you know, that's going to execute things in some particular order, right? And Elixir is not different, okay? We write sequential code in Elixir as well. And the difference is that we get the sequential code in Elixir and we put into something very, very small, very, very cheap, very, very lightweight that we call a process and we create a bunch of those processes, okay? So that's the new word, process. So those processes, they are cheap, they are lightweight, and from now on to the end of the talk, every time I say process, we're not talking about operating system processes, we are talking about this lightweight thread of executions that we have in, 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 in the Erlang VM, right? And they are very cheap, we can create literally millions of those. In the WhatsApp case, I said they had two million connections, right? So they had at least two million processes, okay? So you create a bunch of those. And those processes, they're isolated. They don't know about each other by default, okay? They are completely isolated, which means that they can all run at the same time, right? So that's how we're starting to get the idea of concurrency. We have all th these very cheap, lightweight uh, processes, and they are isolated, so they can all run at the same time. And then if by any chance they need to communicate to get something done together, they do so explicitly by message passing, by sending messages to each other, okay? So we are talking about processes now, we are talking about message passing. But let's continue, going, let's continue to go deeper. Let's imagine that, you know, we, we have the system here running all those processes, and let's imagine that this system is a web application. And in a web application, you can, there's a bunch of stuff that we need to do, right? We need to talk to the database, uh, we need to accept the web request. So if somebody, you know, types the address in the browser URL, that's going to come as a request through TCP something that we need to serve. Uh, maybe we have a, a process that is responsible for gathering statistics or metrics to show in a dashboard uh, or something similar. And, you know, we may have a mailer that is responsible for sending email, right? Because those processes, they are uh, all isolated from each other, right? If something goes wrong in here, in any of those processes, it does not affect the other processes, right? The other processes do not know about it. And this leads to a very interesting style of development where we're saying, well, it's okay for things to crash. It's okay to let it crash. It's okay for things to fail fast, right? So, so let's take an example. If you're, if you're going back to, you know, to those usual imperative object-oriented languages, right? What happens if you're trying to send, there is a request, you're trying to send an email, and sending that email fails, right? What can happen is that if sending that email fails, there can be an exception that can blow the whole system up, right? Can shut down everything, can shut down the database, it can shut down the web request, it can shut down the statistic server, right? Because we have this huge chunk of sequential code, right? Um, and the only reason we don't see that happening in practice, right? Except for some very rare cases, the only reason we don't see that happening in practice is because we put like try-catch blocks, right, around your request. So if you have a web framework, it's very likely that your web framework, when it's calling your code, there is a huge try-catch around that thing, right, to make sure that, you know, if something goes wrong, it doesn't leak, right? So we say, well, we need to catch errors, we need to, to, to catch exceptions, right? Which is very weird because the exception, if you think about it, right, the exception and error is the way of our system to say, hey, something went wrong, and we're like, sure, fine, whatever, right? Just continue doing uh, whatever you're doing, right? And then, and that's why sometimes we get into a weird state where we're rescuing something that we shouldn't, and then the system go into a state that it can never, that it's permanently corrupted, okay? Right? What happens if the mailer, for example, what, if, what happens if the mailer started failing because there was in, a corruption in the connection? How are we going to handle that? Right? If you're just saying, hey, continue going, continue doing the same thing over and over again. In Elixir, we don't do that. We don't, like, we don't really like uh, catching exceptions. What we say instead is that, hey, you know, if there is something wrong with the mailer, sure, that process can crash. We know that those processes are isolated, so it's not going to affect the other processes in the system. And what we have is that we define supervisors for the process, say, hey, if something goes wrong with the mailer, there is this particular kind of process called a supervisor, where its only job is to look at the other process in the system and say, oh, that one shut down, something went wrong. Let's start a new process back in its place to continue doing uh, whatever it was doing, right? And why this is a good idea, right? Why this is such a powerful idea? 
I mean, we see that happening in in practice, in real life all the time, right? Like sometimes you're using our computer and our computer is not working or, you know, sometimes you're, you want to print a document and the printer doesn't work. What do we do, right? We say, okay, I'll restart the printer. And then you restart it and then it just works beautifully. The document prints now and it goes back to working, to a working state. And the reason we do that, the reason why we start things and the reason why start restarting things works is that every time we start the system, we put the system back into that initial state, right? That is guaranteed to work. The manufacturer tests that initial state, that boot procedure a lot, because if that fails, right, then, then there is no solution, right? So it's really well tested, right? So here's the same idea. If there's something wrong in your software, instead of saying, hey, you know, you may be corrupted, I don't know your state, right? But just continue working. We say, it's fine, let it crash. There is a supervisor, the supervisor is going to notice it and start a new one in its place with a fresh state that is guaranteed to work, right? And sometimes the supervisor, they have supervisors themselves, right? So we start to building this thing that resembles a supervision tree and we package the supervision trees into things that we call applications, right? So I know at this point, I've been talking a lot uh, and adding new words to our vocabularies. We are talking about processes. We are talking about um, supervised applications. So let's see something a little bit more practical, okay? So here I have, so in Elixir, we have a web framework called Phoenix, okay? And this is an application built on top of Phoenix called Livebook. Livebook is a collaborative and interactive uh, code and notebook editor in Elixir. So if you, want, if you want to learn Elixir, it's a great way of doing so because uh, you just need to run a Docker command. It's going to install Livebook in your machine. And then you can come here and you, know, you, you can write some notes. You can uh, execute some Elixir code. You can do whatever you want. You can write some code and play with those ideas, right? Not the focus right now, but one, one of the things I want to show here is that because this is a, is using the Phoenix web framework, that is a web framework for Elixir. It's built on all those principles that we have been talking about. And Phoenix comes with something that we call a live dashboard, right? That is a way to introspect the system. So in this live dashboard here, um, you know, we can see information about what is the version that it's running, uh, memory allocation and so on. Uh, not going to go into that, I'm going to focus on two things. So the first one, is processes. By clicking on the process tab, we can actually see all of the processes in the system, right? And not only that, I can, you know, I can double click them and get some information about, you know, who they are connected to, how that process started, uh, some information about garbage collection, what is the stack trace of what it's doing right now, right? So we can get a lot of information out of a running system. And this is fantastic, right? Because we are talking about, hey, you know, I want this state to be explicit. All the state in Elixir exists inside processes. And I can list all the processes, which means that I can go through things, right? I can go through all this state, right? And, um, and, and double click and try to understand how my system works, right? And not only that, this is great for understanding a live system and finding potential issues. So for example, uh, we talked that processes, they communicate by sending messages to each other, right? So uh, when, when you send a message to a process, that, that message goes to the process inbox, to, to the message queue, okay? So for example, we said that in WhatsApp, they were able to get 2 million connections on a single machine. And the Phoenix Framework team, they, were, they actually they reproduced those, res those results. So we think you can build like real-time applications where you connect for WebSocket, for example, and start receiving events from the server, right? They, they actually replicated, they were able to get 2 million connections on a single machine as well, the same case that WhatsApp did. And what was really interesting is that when, the, when, when we tried to reproduce this benchmark, Right? We, we had to set up like 50 different machines to, to simulate all of this load that we had to send to the server. And we started doing that. We reached our first bottleneck. I think it was about 50K connections, right? Which is way too short, right? Like imagine like, hey, let's try to get two million connections and then you get 50K and you, and, you, know, you can't go further than that, right? You, you reach a bottleneck. But how do we solve that bottleneck? We literally open up Observer, so which is a tool that comes with Verlang. It's no web based. It's a uh, it's a desktop application, but it's, the dashboard is is inspired on that. So the same thing here that we can do here, which is well, we said well, if there is a bottleneck, most likely there is a process in the system that everybody's trying to talk to, 
but and that makes that and that process cannot keep up. So the message queue is likely growing and growing and growing. So what we did is I were like, okay, uh, so what if we order by message queue? We order by message queue and we immediately saw that there was indeed a process that was a bottleneck. Everybody was trying to talk to that process. That process could not keep up. So we saw that bottleneck and then we're able to go to, uh, I think, uh, hundreds uh, of thousands of connections. Then we found the next bottleneck and then we solved that in a very similar way. And when we saw, we were able to get 2 million connections. 2 million connections on a single machine use Phoenix as well, right? So this shows like how powerful those words and those ideas are, right? Of expressing everything with processes and make sure that they are isolated and we can see them, right? And introspect them. And not only we can list all the processes, we can list all the applications. So remember, we have processes, they have supervisors, and sometimes they become supervision trees that we package into applications. So any Elixir system, any Erlang system is made of multiple applications all running at the same time with their supervision trees. And it's all listed here and I can double click it. So for example, Elixir itself is an application. I can double click and I can see Elixir supervision tree or um, the name of this application in particular is Livebook, right? So I can come here, I can find a uh, Livebook and you know, I can see all the supervision tree that makes this web application, right? Everything re related to supervising the sessions, to supervising the endpoints, so we accept the web requests and so on. Everything is here. I can go, I can click around, I can see it, right? So it really brings a lot of understand into the system, a lot of introspection and monitoring into the system too. So um, yeah, so let's go back to the presentation. So, you know, we talked about applications. We saw how it brings introspection and monitoring, uh, how it gives a visibility to the application state because, you know, everything is in processes and I can see the supervision tree. I can see the processes that are part of an application. It's also easy to break into components, right? So imagine that I'm working this application. This application is growing and growing and growing when we want to break it apart. Now I can look at the supervision tree and say, well, what if I get this part of the supervision tree and move elsewhere? right? Or what if I get this branch, right? It, it's a very visible way for you to look at your application. And it also brings the reasoning when things go wrong. I, I did not show that, but I can actually go there and say, hey, I want to terminate this process in the supervision tree. And I can see the supervisor kicking and bringing another process in its place, right? And we're able to get all those features, all this behavior, because we added new words, right, to our vocabulary. We're not talking about processes, that are lightweight, cheap, and isolated. We are talking about supervisors, right? That uh, are particular kind of processes that have the specific responsibility of restarting part of our code. We are talking about applications, we are talking about message passing. And what we gain from that is that we are now talking about systems that are concurrent, right? We are now talking about failing fast. If there's something wrong, we're like, no, I'm not catching exceptions anymore. It's fine if something goes wrong because I'm going to restart a new version. Uh, I'm going to start a new version of that process, right? With the initial state that's going to work. So we are thinking about fault tolerance now. We are thinking about systems that can heal themselves because if something goes wrong, they restart that particular branches, that particular processes, those particular trees. And there's one word that is actually in the, in the talk description that we haven't explored so far, right? Which is, well, everything is also distributed. And how does that work? Given everything is done with processes and those processes, they communicate uh, by exchanging messages, it actually doesn't matter if a message is in the same machine or is in a different machine. Everything just works. You can send messages across machines out of the box. You don't need to do anything else. Right? You just need to say, hey, those two different nodes exist and now processes between them can communicate. And I can actually show an example of this if we go back to to, to Livebook, right? So again, Livebook is built with the Phoenix Web Framework in Elixir, and it's a fully collaborative and interactive application. And in order to show it working, what I have is that I have two instances running, I just started before the talk, two instances of this web application. It's running on my machine, but it would work fine on separate machines. But those are two separate operating system processes, two separate instances running on separate ports. Okay, so if I copy the address of this notebook here and I just change the port because now I'm going to a separate instance. Um, and 
how dumb I am. I want to put those side by side. So, and then I put them side by side now. You can see here, so you can see it's the same, it's the same session, right? But I'm running on different nodes, right? This, in production, this would be separate machines, right? And you can see here that um, as I change thing here, the, the right side here as well is automatically update, updating, right? So um, you can see how it just works even with different machines. And that's all built on top of the distribution. So the way it works is that when you start the session, a, a notebook that's running on a, a, on a particular machine, right? And then when the other machine comes up, it, it asks in the cluster, hey, you know, who is responsible for this session in the whole cluster of machines, right? And then the other node is like, hey, I have the session, right? It, it's this thing is, is, I have this process that is responsible for understanding this code notebook. And then the other node is like, okay, it's you. So Whenever anything does something on it, just let me know. So you have an event system where we have this notebook process right here that has you know everything that we wrote. And then all the clients, regardless where they are on the cluster, they are receiving updates uh, of those changes as they come in, okay? So yeah. So um, this is an example of distribution. And again, all you need to do this, you don't need, you don't need a separate database. You don't need uh, a, a message key, right? It's all part of, of uh, the Erlang runtime, the Erlang virtual machine. All right, so let's go back to the presentation. So yeah, distribution, it comes for free. We've evolved that and uh, we can leverage that to build really you know, collaborative interactive applications as Livebook is an example of, right? And it just, it just works, right? Um, all right. So, okay. So we talked about the idioms, right? We talked about all those new words and we saw an actual example in Livebook, how we can leverage that in practice to, to, to build something that is collaborative and works in a cluster and with as little effort as possible because you're just using message passing. Okay. So, um, but the thing is, everything I've talked so far, it actually comes from Erlang right? None of it specific to Elixir. I didn't create, to be clear, I didn't create any of those things that I have been talking about so far, right? Any of those abstractions, right? So, um, so why Elixir, right? So what Elixir brings different to the table, okay? And that's the last part of the talk that I want to, that we are going to explore now. So, and I like to talk about Elixir uh, using its goals. What were the goals that we had when we created the language? And the goals are compatibility, extensibility and productivity. And the first goal compatibility is easy, right? It just means that everything I've shown so far, right? It comes from Erlang and you can just leverage, use that from Elixir, right? With no performance cost, no performance barrier whatsoever. In fact, you can call Erlang from Elixir and vice versa with no cost at all, okay? So everything's compatible, that's easy, goal number one. Goal number two is about accessibility. And I love this quote from Guy Steele uh, at the end of Growing a Language, a, a talk he gave where he says, now we need to go meta. We should now think of a language design as being a pattern for language designs, a tool for making more tools of the same kind. And you know, like today computer science, there are like so many applications that is impossible for us to design a language that is going to excel at all of them. Right? So what we need to do is that we need to design a language where we can extend the language and bring this language to new domains. Okay, so here's an example, right? Which is, uh, so I think this is the first time we are seeing some proper Elixir code, okay? So this is the unit test framework that comes with Elixir, okay? And so here's some Elixir code, we first define a module, then we say, hey, we want to define our test case in here, and then we start defining our tests, like, you know, uh, I want to test some basic operations, and then we do assertions. So depending on the language you are coming from, right, this is a no-go, right? You can say like, hey, assert this, right? Because uh, you, you actually have to be very explicit, like, hey, I want to assert that those things are equal, I want to assert that those things are different, I want to assert this, assert that. Like, you need to be, test, you need to be telling the test framework precisely what you want to do, okay? But with Elixir, um, we just use assert. And that's because assert is a macro that looks at the code. And by looking at the code, it can say, hey, I can see here that they're trying to compare things. 
And then, so it doesn't put any pressure on the developer to be using a very large testing API. You just put a cert in front of the things that you want to assert. And that's, and that's just a macro, it's not really part of the language, right? And then when there is an error report, it's going to be very precise, very specific about it. And say, hey, I saw that we're trying to compare these two things. This thing is this, this thing is that, but this thing you're missing the exclamation mark that is in the other one. So it's very specific, very clear about what you're trying to do, right? And all you need to do is to say assert. Every, the language figures everything else. So that's a very simple example of getting Elixir as a programming language and extend it to a particular domain. But let's see another example. So Acto is a library that comes uh, with Elixir that allows you to talk to databases. And here's an example of an Acto query, how you would write a query. And what Acto is going to do is that it's going to make sure that there are no SQL injection attacks, it's going to make sure that those queries are composable, and it's going to convert that to SQL and send that to the database. Right? So you can write those queries using the Elixir constructs that you get familiar with and, and have that automatically transform into something that, um, that you can run again against Postgres, MySQL, and so on. Right? And the interesting thing is that Acto is a library. Right? It's not part of Elixir as a programming language. So for example, developers coming from .NET uh, we have link in .NET and you are going to see a lot of similarities, but link is literally language integrated query. They change the language in order to add those features. While in Elixir, Acto is just a library. They didn't have to change the language in order to implement it because the language is accessible. So they're able to get the language and bring it to the domain of you know, SQL queries and how to write all those complex constructs that you may want to do when you want to interface with a database. Another example, this is a more recent one, is NX. So NX stands for Numerical Elixir. And one of the things that you can do with NX is that you can write this thing that uh, we call numerical definitions. So instead of saying def, which is how we, we define a function in Elixir, you say defn. And that defn is a subset of Elixir, right? It has very similar semantics to exactly how Elixir works. It looks exactly like Elixir. But we can actually get the code inside defn and compile it to run on the GPU. And that enables a whole class of applications with numerical computing, machine learning, neural networks, by having the subset of the language that it's, we can compile and it's guaranteed to run the GPU. Right? So this, again, another example of getting Elixir as a programming language and extend it to a whole new domain. Okay. So, uh, that's accessibility, and those are some examples. We saw testing, uh, numerical computing, uh, databases, and there are many more you're going to find in the community. And the third goal is productivity, right? And productivity is hard to talk about because how can you say that one language is more productive than the other, right? So instead of going to this discussion, uh, the way we think about productivity is, well, we want to make sure that you are going to have a good time. You are going to feel productive. Right? And it's especially important because Elixir is a functional programming language. And a lot of people, they don't have any, they didn't have any introduction to functional programming. So a lot of those concepts, they're going to be new, right? When you're talking about, you know, transformation instead of mutation, or when we are talking about processes, all those concepts, all those words, they are new. So we need to make sure that the documentation is really first class. Uh, the link, documentation needs to be uh, easy to write easy to read, it should be accessible, because we want to make sure that if you watch this talk, you're like, hey, I want to give it a try, you're going to have a good time and you're going to feel productive doing it and you're going to, to, to have fun doing that. So first class documentation, first class tooling. So in the language, it comes with XUnit, which is the, the test framework. It comes with IX, which is interactive Elixir. Uh, it comes with Mix, which is kind of your build tool. So if you're starting a project, that's what you're going to use. And that's only what is part of the language, right? There is a whole ecosystem as well. I showed Livebook um, a couple minutes ago, which is another way you can explore and learn about the language and so on. And there's also a fantastic community of packages. So we have a package manager called Hex. And, you know, as, uh, as the community grows, we start publishing those packages and sharing reusing code. So let's see some examples of that. So here's how our documentation looks like. So if you start, you know, if you go look into Elixir, start looking at our docs, this is exactly how they look like. Uh, we put a lot of effort and attention into our docs, not only when writing them, but in our documentation tools. And this documentation tool 
is av- that we use for Elixir is available for the whole community. So, you know, as you go and start using different packages, you're going to see that everything is standardized uh, on this tool and that provides a very good unified experience. And as I said, documentation should be easy to write and easy to read. So making it easy to read means that it should be accessible everywhere, right? It should be accessible in your browser. It should be accessible in your IDE. If you are in the terminal and you want to access documentation or any module or function, you just type H and then the name of the module or the function, and that comes up immediately. So uh, very, very important, right? And then there is the Hex Package Manager, which is not only the package manager for Elixir, but for the whole Erlang ecosystem, okay? And uh, in there, we are going to find um, a, a bunch of libraries and a bunch of high-level frameworks, such as the Phoenix framework that we're talking about for building web applications. and It's going to be a highlight, especially if you're building interactive web real-time applications. Another example is NERVS. So NERVS is a framework for building high-ended embedded applications, embedded software. And the idea behind NERVS, it's really interesting. It, well, because imagine you're building embedded software, right? And then you have to manage things like, you know, camera, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. So what is going to happen if something goes wrong with the the Wi-Fi driver? right? Like, how do you handle that, right? Do you tell users to restart the device? So what the Nerves team realized, right, when they looked at Erlang, they said, well, you know, the supervision I, tree idea is great because if something goes wrong with the Wi-Fi, I just want to restart it, right? I want to restart that driver. So what if we use those principles to manage a embedded device, right? To manage our embedded software. And that's exactly the principles that uh, Nerves was built on top of. Okay, and there are a bunch of exciting ideas that you can go to Nerves uh, to explore. Then there is the main brain framework about audio video streaming and a bunch more that we cannot explore all of them, right? So if you want to learn more, go to our website. We have a learning sec- a learning page that lists a bunch of the uh, books, screencasts, and learning materials that you're going to find in the community. And we also have guides on the website, which is a fast-paced introduction to the main language concepts, okay? And on the website, you're also going to find cases. So we started last year a bunch of production cases from companies using Elixir in production. One of the cases I want to mention in this talk is the one from Pinterest. Um, So at Pinterest, uh, we have this quote from Steve Cohen, where he said, well, when... When I started on this pen team, we had close to uh, 1,400 servers running. When we converted several parts of the system to Elixir, they reduced, they reduced the amount of servers by 95%. And when they did that, the performance and reliability of the system went up, right? They were running on less hardware, but the response times dropped, right? As did the errors. So at the end, he says that the combined effect of better architecture and Elixir save Pinterest over $2 million a year in, ser- in server costs. So uh, there are many other cases on the Elixir website. We are adding more every month and two months now. So you can go to the website, you can learn more about the cases that we have, or you can follow us and learn more about the upcoming cases we are going to have in the next months. And that's what I had to share about Elixir today. So thank you for our time.